The next topic is uh, the final part of uh, computational learning theory, which it is, we are going to look at this topic of uh, VC dimension. And along the way, we'll look at this really cool uh, idea called shattering. And your current homework um, is a lot about VC dimension. And uh, you, know, you might want to pay attention. So just to kind of uh, step back and see where we are, we are looking at computational learning theory. We looked at this definition of probably approximately correct learning, and we derived an Occam's razor result for the case where our, our hypothesis space is finite and the, the hypothesis space contains the true concept. And using that, we looked at some positive and negative learnability results. Then we, we, we gave up that requirement that the hypothesis space contains the true concept. That takes us to agnostic learning. We derived an Occam's razor result there also, and they kind of look the same, almost with minor detail differences. Now, the next thing we are going to do is give up this assumption that uh, our hypothesis space is finite, and we'll derive another result. We won't derive it. I will just uh, define things and uh, just show you the result because that derivation is a nightmare. Um, and we'll see how to, you know, we'll, we, we'll look at how we can think about fact learning in those settings. So, you, you know, the, the key observation when we start thinking about infinite hypothesis spaces is intuitively, some infinite hypothesis spaces are more expressive than some others. Imagine that my, uh, I have a, a, a learning problem where everything, all the points inside a box are plus and everything outside is minus. And my goal is to discover the best a rectangle that can perfectly encapsulate all the positive numbers, or not the positive numbers, the positive examples. Now, let's say learning algorithm one was allowed to use rectangles, and learning algorithm two was allowed to use what did I put here? 17 sided convex polygons. 17 sided convex polygons can kind of maneuver better around the space, and maybe it is more expressive. So, is there uh, something that we can say about that. Another example that you've already encountered partly is uh, with linear classifiers. A linear classifier cannot express an XOR function because if you have plus, minus, minus, plus, and minus, you cannot draw a line that separates both of the, the pluses from the minus. But if I draw, if I'm allowed to use two lines and say this side is plus and this side is plus, the intersection of the two pluses of the, gives me perfectly gives me, a, you know, separates the pluses and the minus. So a combination of linear threshold units is more expressive than a single linear threshold unit. And both of them are an infinite, are infinite sets. So uh, this is the key point, right? Some, even though these sets of functions are infinite, some infinite sets are better than some other infinite sets. So what we need is some, a way to measure the expressiveness of these types of functions. And Clearly, the size of the set is, is useless. The answer is something called the VC dimension. VC stands for Raphnik Chervonenkis. I always get the name wrong. Um, it's a measure which uh, I'll just, I, from now on, I'll just say VC dimension and try not to embarrass myself by pronouncing the name. So the VC dimension is a measure of expressiveness uh, of a set of functions. Or another way of thinking about it is it answers the question, what is the capacity of the set of functions? What kinds of uh, uh, you know, dichotomies, what kinds of uh, partitions of pluses and minuses can this set of functions uh, capture? It, is, it behaves like the size of H. In fact, more properly, it behaves like the log of the size of H. And we will see that in the, uh, the sample complexity bound, essentially, you can, it, the log of the size of the hypothesis space is like your VC dimension. In fact, one of your homework questions actually asks you to prove that for uh, uh, finite hypothesis spaces, and we hopefully you'll be able to do that either by the end of this lecture. Well, we only have 25 minutes. Definitely by the middle of the next lecture. Let's start with uh, rectangles. Assume that uh, the target concept is something called an axis parallel rectangle, a rectangle whose uh, sides are parallel to the axis. So maybe uh, the, the, this particular box is the true rectangle that we want to find. What that means is all points inside the box are positive and all points outside 
are negative. This is the Oracle function. This is the ground truth that our learning algorithm hopes to discover from data. Imagine that you have these three data points. Any reasonable learning algorithm would find, would do something like this, would construct a box like that. Right? It just puts a box around all the positive points and then you're done. Everything inside the box is positive, everything outside the box is negative. Clearly, the Go, the thing that the learning algorithm found is not the same as the thing that that as the ground truth. So now let's say that you get a few more points. Well, you can grow the rectangle, and uh, still you've not hit the ground truth. Maybe you get a few more points, nothing changed, so there's no reason to grow the rectangle. One more point, you grow the rectangle. With any finite number of points, will you ever be able to get the target rectangle exactly? Assuming that the, the points never lie on the boundary. Is it, is it possible to learn the target rectangle perfectly with a finite number of data points? What do you think? Who said no? What? I'll give you an infinite number of examples, a countably infinite. I'll give you a countably infinite number of examples with the guarantee that they do not lie on the rectangle. Can you learn it exactly? There is a, I think, yes. Does anyone want to say yes? Uh, that's that's the right intuition. That's how I think about it as well. Yes. Not on the actual boundary? Yes. And I would say no. Why not? Uh, because it was quite simple on the boundary. Uh-huh. 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 Uh-huh.
these two points are labels. Can I find a linear classifier that puts all the circles on one side and all the triangles on the other side? Well, proof by pictures, of course I can. Um, I can, you know, if it's, uh, if the, if I have a lab, lab, two labels, you know, two different labels, I put the classifier in between like here and here. If I have the same label, I just put the class, the line outside both of them. So it's possible to law, draw a line that separates the positive and negative points for every labeling of those two points. This, what I just said, it's possible to find a linear classifier that separates every labeling of these two points is an interesting property. It applies to two points. You can ask, is it proof for three points? Let's give that property a name. That property is called shattering. We say that linear functions are expressive enough, linear functions in two dimensions are expressive enough to shatter two points. Shatter just means it's possible to find a classifier that can perfectly uh, separate every possible labeling of those two points. So far, so good. I've just given you a name. I mean, this is just a name for something that hopefully is an intuitive idea. Questions before we... No question? Okay. Rather than going from 2 to 3, let's jump straight ahead to 14. What about 14 points? Can linear functions shatter 14 points? Are there any 14 points that linear functions can shatter? Here are 14 points. And trust me, there are 14 here. Um, I can try to find a labeling. This labeling is perfectly separable by a line. But this is not the one that is interesting because remember, for shattering, I wanted every possible labeling to be separable. Right? Not just find a labeling that's separable, but I need to consider every possible ways to assign labels to these 14 points. And here's a labeling that cannot be separated by any line. You can try to put a line wherever you want, and there is no way that that line separates the positives and the negatives. So what we say is linear classifiers in two dimensions cannot shatter 14 points because there is at least one labeling that does not, uh, that cannot be separated by any function from that set any function from that uh, set of functions, right? Questions. Linear functions are not expressive enough to shatter 14 points. Yeah. So what about the uh, grid? Yes. And we will, that's a, yes, the, it, it, it can. In fact, it can shatter d plus one point, turns out. But here's a, a function that does, uh, you know, um, that does separate out the pluses and the minus, the triangles from the circles. It does not, it's not the fact that linear classifiers cannot separate those 14, cannot shatter those 14 points, does not mean no function class can shatter those 14 points. There is some function class. Let's call this function class the set of all wiggly curves. The set of all wiggly curves can uh, shatter 14 points. Well, if it's a set of all wiggly curves, it can shatter any number of points but in particular 14 points. No matter how you label these 14 points, I can create one wiggly curve that uh, kind of separates the pluses and the minuses by just going around all of these things. So a more complicated function class can separate, can, can separate arbitrary labelings. Simpler function classes cannot separate them. This is what, this is an intuitive definition of simplicity of function classes. Let's formally define shattering. Uh, we have 15 minutes, so maybe I'll even get done with shattering today. So a set of examples, S. S is a, a finite set here. We imagine that you're given a set of examples and a set of functions H. So we have S is a set of examples and H is a set of functions. And in particular, we are talking about binary classifiers. So there's a set of functions that separate out the examples into pluses and minuses. I say that uh, the set of examples is shattered by the set of functions if no matter how I label the examples with plus and minus, some function in my set can perfectly agree with that. No matter, let's go back to the two points. 
No matter how I label those two points with pluses and minus, some linear classifier could agree with that partition of the example. No matter how I label the set of examples with plus and minus, some classifier in the set in my function class can give exactly those labels. The intuition is that uh, a function class that stack, that shatters larger number of points is a richer one. Rich, I should have put rich in quotes here. It's a more expressive set of functions. Any questions about this? This is just a definition. I'm going to work through a few examples of this so that you get comfortable with this idea. Yes. There are we think there are versions of this definition that make it a little bit more that get a little bit more messy, but there are. What space? There is no dimensionality. I just have a set of examples. I have a set of uh, the dimensionality comes into play when um, we consider the functions to be of a certain type. Who said linear class? Who said these are real valued functions? It could be any function, right? Um, I could have a function that looks at a email and does not really think of this as a high dimensional feature space, and instead it's a Python program that looks at the email headers and makes a decision. Um, this is, this the dimensionality will come into play eventually, but the definition of shattering does not include dimensionality. It's just a property of two things. It's a property of a set and uh, a set of uh, examples and a set of functions, a set of points and a set of functions that assign labels to those points. That's really what it is. Let's uh, let's look at at least a few examples. The first example is a very very simple one. It's called left bounded intervals. It's a hypothesis class. It says it's it's defined by a single number a, and basically this function takes a real number and says the label is plus if that number is between zero and a. So every point in this region is labeled plus. Every point outside is labeled minus. It takes a positive number and gives it a label plus if that number is less than A. If that number is more than A, it treats it as a minus. It's about as simple as a function class as you can think of, right? The instances, the set of points that we are going to worry about are one dimensional points. So, what we have here is uh, uh, let's now work through this example and try to find how many points can this set of functions shatter. Let's say I, I pick a set consisting of one point. So my set S consists of one point, this point here. It's just one element. Okay. So what does the definition of shattering ask us to do? It asks us to consider, entertain the possibility that this set of points that we have is labeled in every possible way. And we have only one point. It can either be a plus or a minus. So we can ask, what can I, what can happen if that label, that point is labeled plus? If that point is labeled plus, I can find a classifier, a function that assigns the label plus. What I'll do is just put the a outside that. Uh, I'll I'll make this interval larger than uh, that point. Well, the point is contained inside the interval, so the 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 the, the this particular value of a assigns a label plus, so it agrees with the label. In other words, if my label is plus, then I can find an A such that the resulting classifier also gives it a label plus. If that point has a label minus, I can find a different A that also contain, that also gives it the label minus. The hypothesis class that we are entertaining here is essentially the set of all functions of this type. So if I decide that my only these points are positive, then this gets a label minus. No matter which label that point is given, I'll be able to assign, I'll be able to find a function in my function class that gives the same label. Questions? Either this is blindingly obvious or this is like I've lost you. Yeah. So. This assumes that I can 
Yeah. No, we are assuming that our instance space, the set of points contains only positive numbers here. So this means what we have done here is a proof because we have considered every possible labeling. What we have here is a proof that a set consisting of one point can be shattered by uh, this class of left bounded intervals. And by the way, I chose this one point here. You might ask, maybe this one point is special. Had I picked this point here, it won't be shattered. Well, no, it can, right? I, if I pick this point, if I call it a plus, I'll put an A here. Uh, if it's a minus, I'll just put an A here. So a set consisting of any one point can be shattered by this class of function. Okay, what about two points? I'm going to work through this again. Um, in order to define, in order to you know, see whether this set can be shattered, I need to consider every possible labeling of these two points. So we can, I need to consider the, how many possible labelings of these two points exist. Four. So I'm going to write them here. There's a, both can be plus. And can you tell me, let's say this is a five and this is 10. You know, this is like a, on the number line. Can you tell me a value of A such that both, let's call this A and B, A and B will be labeled as positive. 9,000. When A equals 9,000, um, every number between zero and 9,000 is going to be labeled positive, in particular, five and 10. Okay, let's consider plus and minus. Can you tell me an A that labels A? Uh, uh, I use, I let me not use A and B, let's say P and Q. Can you tell me a value of A that labels P as positive and Q as negative? Six. So 9,000 is here. Six is here, right? So I have a zero here. So everything in between from zero to, okay. What about two minuses? A equals four. When A is four, everything here is positive and uh, both P and Q are labeled minus. Okay, what about minus plus? No, I can try to put an A here, but this one's gonna be wrong. I can try to put an A here, both of them are going to be wrong. I can put A here, but this one's going to be wrong. So no matter which value of A I pick, calling the point P as minus and the point Q as plus is going to pull my hypothesis class. There is not a single function in my entire infinite set of functions that can match with labels, right? So that means, all we need is one counter example because for shattering every possible labeling has to be matched. So if I can find one counter example that cannot be matched by my function class, then that function class cannot shatter the set. So we can label these points such that no hypothesis in our class uh, can match the labels. And this is the one I can, uh, if I put an A to the left of the first point, then the second point is incorrectly labeled. If I put the A on the right of it, it labels incorrectly labels the first one. If I put it in between, both of them are wrong. So what we have proved here is that the set of left bounded intervals can shatter one point, any one point, but it cannot shatter two points. Now you might be wondering, where are we going? Right? This is like, like the very tiny, tiny little things. We're talking about like the number lines and intervals and stuff. Where we are going is uh, from left bounded intervals to, uh, okay, well, let's, one point can be shattered and two points cannot be shattered. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, uh, given one point for any labeling of that point, there is a function in this class that can match it. Given two points, there is at least one labeling that no function in this class can match. We basically, by exhaustively enumerating all possible labelings, we were able to prove these things. Where we are going from here is we started off with left bounded intervals. And the obvious next thing is, uh, let's just take, let's remove, we'll go from left bounded intervals to uh, arbitrary intervals. Instead of a function class having, you know, being bounded at zero and like this, let's consider a range from A to B. Everything inside the range is positive and everything outside is negative, still on the number line. 
So it looks, you know, if you, if you want pictures, it might look something like that. Okay. We are going to go through the same process once again. Can one point be shattered? Let's uh, start at the beginning. Can one point be shattered? So if I have a number line, I have this point here. Yes. Why? Because I can just put the interval around. If it's a plus, I can put the interval around it. Let's put, do it this way. If it's a plus, I can put the interval around it. If it's a minus, well, I can just put the interval here. Everything here is plus and everything outside is minus. So there's some A and B that perfectly agrees with every possible labeling of this one point. Okay, let's consider two points. Remember, two points did not work the last time. So let's consider two points this again. I have two points. And if I consider both pluses, I can put an interval around both of them. If I consider plus minus, I can put an interval here. If I consider minus plus, I can put the interval here. If I consider minus minus, well, I can put it anywhere else. Look, so we have this class of functions, which is strictly more expressive than what we had before. The previous one, left bounded intervals, could not shatter two points. This one can shatter two points. Why? Because I have enumerated every possible labeling, and no matter how it's labeled, I was able to produce a classifier with the brackets that perfectly agrees with that label. So two points can be shattered. What about three points? Who wants to take a guess? Can someone give? So let's say we have three points here, and let's call that P, Q, and R. Can you give me a labeling that cannot be matched by any function in that set? Q is minus and the rest are positive. Now, do I should I go over this in detail? Like there is clearly no function. I cannot put any bracket anywhere such that only the pluses are contained in the bracket and the minuses are not. So this means this particular function class cannot shatter three points. So in order to actually prove this, I, I can't just take three points, uh, some three points and show that it can't be shattered. I should be able to take any three points and shatter it. Maybe these three points that I chose were special because uh, of some property. It should work for any three points. Luckily, on the number line, there that there's only one configuration in which three points can be arranged on the line. So no matter which three points you pick, those three points cannot be shattered by intervals. Yes. No, of course they are distinct. Okay. Uh, yes. You're saying that the can be shattered enough to include all of them, all of them? It, to prove that it cannot be shattered, well, not really. We're talking about a set of examples, right? Yes. So there is a set of examples that cannot be shattered. That's what we showed here. It just so happens in this case, this is a general configuration. Any set of examples is gonna, is gonna look like this. So it just so happens that I can generalize from saying these three points cannot be shattered to no three points can be shattered because all three points look like this. In the, on the line, any, you. On, you draw a number line and you just pick three points and they're going to look like this, just a matter of scaling in and out. Uh, um, I, I understand that in this case, it's that general. Yes. Points, but if it wasn't, why would, why would, like, this part, see, remember, shattering is just a property of a set of points. Yeah. It's, it's just a statement that this set of points cannot be shattered. Okay. That's really what it is. Eventually, when we talk about weekly dimension, we have to start talking about arbitrary configurations. Uh, but since we are out of time, I'm not going to do that now. In the next lecture, I'm going to start from this point and then talk about uh, the next thing. There is a question on, uh, on Zoom. I'll just read it out and answer it very quickly. Can feature expansion be used to help a function class shatter a specific set of examples? The answer is yes, because if you do feature expansion, you are enriching the set of functions. So the answer is yes. But we'll pick up from here on Tuesday.